Um, so, uh, so the first two programs uh, were uh, uh, people from the space program uh, who really took us to Mars and beyond and, and shared with us, among other things, uh, the fact that uh, we're apparently on schedule to do a manned mission to Mars in 2035. Um, so that's pretty exciting for those, those of us who were, who were here for the moon landing in 1969. I mean, uh, this is going to be just even more cool, cool than that. But tonight we're going in the exactly opposite direction with a completely earthbound program uh, of uh, uh, urban, <laughs> urban farming. But it picks up on one of the, I think, most, more endearing aspects of the book, which is that uh, uh, they are indefatigable indefatigable protagonist Mark Watney figured out how to grow potatoes in Mars, on Mars. Um, our uh, speaker tonight, uh, Novella Carpenter, grows potatoes in Oakland uh, and, uh, uh, and, and a whole lot of other things uh, and, and also raises, uh, uh, raises animals. Um, Novella is the author of uh, two books, Farm City, The Education of an Urban Farmer, about her personal journey, uh, and uh, The Essential Urban Farmer, which is the handbook uh, for uh, anybody who wants to try and even come close to following in her footsteps. She is, uh, teaches uh, uh, farming and writing uh, at USF, and um, uh, she was able to tell me that and it looks like most of you already know that a potato is actually a tuber. So please join me in welcoming Novella Carpenter. Thank you. Huh? Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Lovely. Hi, you guys. Yeah, it's a self-selecting group. You're like, I'm not watching the debate. Um, thanks for being here. Um, so I was, yeah, farming in Oakland. Is it the same as farming on Mars? Um, not really. <laughs> um, so I raise, I um, have raised, and that's what Farm City is um, primarily about, is about raising animals um, in, um, in the city, illegally or not. So someone was like, what's that, what's she doing there? Can you raise pigs, can you? Um, I'm here to tell you, there I am herding my pigs. Um, God, that was back in 2005. Um, so 10, 11 years ago. Um, and someone did notice that I am wearing flip-flops, which is not a good idea in a pig sty. Not a good idea. Because um, pigs, you know, they like to kind of like nibble things and they'll nibble your toe right off. Um, has anyone raised pigs here? Anyone pig farms? No, okay. Um, it also smells really bad right there. And I like to start here because it's sort of like the spiraling madness of urban farming. Um, and this is kind of when I hit bottom, when I actually had pigs in my backyard and I was dumpster diving for them every day. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then I'm going to explain to you how this happened. So maybe you won't do this. I don't think it's going to happen. Um, so here's Ghost Town Farm. Uh, that's actually, uh, where it says 580, it's actually 980, um, which hooks up to 24, which leads me right here to Walnut Creek. Um, but where's the farm? It's not that giant green field, I wish. No, it's a little blob right there. It's on the corner. It's a corner lot. It's 4,500 square feet of land. Um, interestingly, the big green space, which I've been eyeing for years, um, I was thinking sheep, you know, yeah. I could raise sheep out there, um, was a former school, Marcus Foster School. Um, and it has now been completely bulldozed. The school is gone. Um, and now they are building Oakland's uh, school district's kitchen there. Um, so it's going to be a giant commissary um, and urban farm. And in the literature that they gave out, they said, the rich tradition of urban farming in this neighborhood. <laughs> and I was like, let me get my cane out, you know, like, okay, it's a rich tradition now. Um, so I <clears throat> moved here in 2003 and started um, squat farming on this, on this little piece of property there. And I think I have a better picture. Yeah, this is kind of like back in the day picture. Um, this is actually like a scanned photograph. Um, but so, um, moved in, saw this abandoned lot, I moved into the apartment in the background there. Not the, not the giant abandoned brick building, don't worry, that's still there. 
that hasn't been torn down. Um, but uh, the, the gray up, um, duplex there. So I lived in the upstairs apartment. And um, I just moved there from Seattle, from Oakland. Uh, I mean, from Seattle to Oakland. I was still like getting used to the microclimate. How many of you guys are growing food or have any? Okay, cool, yeah. Um, so I was really kind of overwhelmed by the, what I needed to learn um, in order to survive. In Seattle, I had a garden and I had raised chickens and bees, um, but this was kind of a new level. Um, so anyway, this is an empty lot and it had all these weeds growing in the cracks and it was a lot of concrete. Um, and so the goal was to, um, to clear it out and plant vegetables and just go for it. Free land for free people, you know? Um, and this is in Ghost Town. The neighborhood that I live in is still called Ghost Town um, because there's all these abandoned buildings, abandoned buildings, abandoned lots, um, burned down houses. Um, so it has this kind of vibe of, uh, you know, the Wild West a little bit. Um, it also was called Ghost Town. I don't know, I haven't totally checked this, but because there used to be two casket companies, dueling casket companies <laughs> on my main street, which is MLK. Um, so it was like, whoa, freaky caskets. Um, so anyway, so that's where, that's where we were. We're clearing, clearing the space out. This is what it looks like a little bit later. Um, there's also a drug bus going on at the same time. So um, I don't take a lot of pictures of my place because I'm busy getting dirty. If I go out in the garden, my hands are immediately dirty, so I can't take photos. Um, but this was actually the view from our upstairs apartment when we lived. We don't live upstairs anymore. We live downstairs. But um, And this was, um, this was an amazing day in Oakland. Um, <clears throat> someone must have been growing too many plants um, at these various warehouses. And right now is the time of year when you walk down MLK and you just you just take a deep breath and it's like it is the smell of pot growing behind every warehouse on the street um, up until about you know 49th street um, so all these roll doors have pot growing behind them is what you pretty much know um, so these cops showed up and it was kind of like a SWAT team type of thing and that's when I get out the camera because that's good times and um, they got closer to the thing and then they got the door open and then you saw all the plants inside. And then for some reason, the cops then left. And so, but the door was still open. And so every teenager in Oakland arrived and grabbed a plant in each hand and like ran down MLK to tell their friends. And so it was like this great Arbor Day of <laughs> Cannabis Day in Oakland. So I did get a picture of that. But anyway, so you can see a lot of the gardening that I was doing at that time was raised beds. Um, what we discovered, there were lots of weeds in the garden in this empty lot, um, which we discovered had been this big apartment building and it had burned down in the 80s. Um, and so we couldn't dig, and plus we were squatting, so we didn't really wanna you know, invest in like a jackhammer and take, getting all this stuff, rubble out. So we just built raised beds over the top of concrete. Um, and it, it worked for years. Um, and we would find all of our materials. <laughs> so, you know, people are always dumping stuff. So we'd find old desks and tables and take them apart and then put, glue them together um, and then throw horse manure. We would actually come out to this area to get the horse manure. Um, Fish Creek Road up on Grizzly Peak. That was, that was like our, that's how we would get here to get the poop. Um, so rotted, rotted horse manure was what we would get. Um, if it had worms in it, that's how we knew it was like, okay, it's safe. Um, so we would bring it back and then we started growing all this food. So, um, and it was also like we had an open gate policy. Anyone could come in, um, help themselves, have some food. I did grow potatoes um, in, these <laughs> in these beds. Um, but what I really like to do is to raise um, animals. Um, so these are, um, this is one of my beehives. And I like to show this picture. Does anyone keep bees here? Anyone keep bees? Okay, right. Because like, I'm wearing like probably the worst thing I could possibly be wearing while keeping bees, which is like a red shirt. Red makes them angry. Um, and those you can't tell, but those are like corduroy pants. So they're like <laughs> kind of soft. So anyway, but, but my point is like, you don't have to be 
you don't always have to do everything right, you know? You just sort of experiment and see what works. Um, so for me, this is, this is the, the beekeeping outfit. Um, so I started keeping bees and, um, in Seattle, and it was kind of how my partner and I, Bill, um, and I really bonded um, through getting bees. And um, it's just a beautiful thing to do. Um, then you get honey for your friends that you can give to people and barter. Um, I just actually bartered honey for goat meat um, at Brothers Market just the other day. So it's like this amazing, you know, um, tool to use for bartering. Um, I also have a lot of fruit trees and I had, once I had the bees, I got my bees back, um, then I noticed that I had better pollination for my fruit. It's almost like the fruit trees knew that the bees were there. Um, and so we have had really good fruit set because of the bees. So bees are good. Um, and this is like, remember you guys, this is the spiral toward madness. Um, so I got my bees and then um, I was like, man, we need to get some chickens. And so here's our, um, here's our chickens. So they cut, this comes in a, let me just back up. The post office delivers this box. Um, and, uh, and sometimes they still do it. In fact, I just got chicks from bio, uh, the Biofuel Oasis in Berkeley, which is where a urban farm store that I helped start with some friends. And um, yeah, he, the postman came with the box, the box of the peepers. Because sometimes we'll get like this frantic call that's like, come pick up your package at the, you know, at the post office right now. Um, and so <laughs> that's, that can be how it can go. Um, but this is, um, this was my box of peepers. Um, and one of the reasons why I wanted to um, get this particular box um, was that it contained turkeys, little turkey poults. And so I'm just gonna read a little section from, um, from Farm City about after the, um, after the mailman gave me this box and I signed for it. And my downstairs neighbor, Mr. Wynn, was like, what the hell is going on around here? As I fiddled with the door to our apartment, the new box of fowl tucked under my arm, I recognized that I was descending deeper into the realm of the underground economy. Now that I had been in California for a few years, I felt ready for what seemed like the next logical progression, something I had never dared in the soggy Northwest, meat birds. I felt a bit nuts, yes, but I also felt great. People move to California to reinvent themselves. They give themselves new names, they go to yoga. Pretty soon they take up surfing or Thai kickboxing or astral healing or witch camp. It's true what they say, California, the land of fruits and nuts. <laughs> in Northern California, one is encouraged to raise their freak flag proudly and often. In Seattle, my mostly hidden freak flag had been being a backyard chicken owner and beekeeper. I loved raising my own food. Not only was it more delicious and fresh, it was also essentially free. Now I was taking it to the next level. Some might say I had been swept up by the Bay Area's mantra repeated ad nauseum to eat fresh, local, free-range critters. At farmer's markets here, and there's one every day, it isn't uncommon to overhear a farmers chatting with consumers about the steer from which their steaks were harvested, what they had been fed, and where the stewing hens had ranged, and what the view was from the sheep pen, um, which was now ground up and laid out on a table, decorated with nasturtium blossoms. Prices correspond with the quality of meat, and Alice Waters assures us that only the best ingredients will make the best meals. But as a poor scrounger with three low-paying jobs and no health insurance, I usually couldn't afford the good stuff. Since I liked eating quality meat and have always had more skill than money, I decided to take matters into my own hands. One night, after living in our ghost town apartment for a few years, I clicked my mouse over various meat bird packages offered by Murray McMurray Hatchery website. Murray McMurray sold day-old ducklings, quail, pheasant, turkey poults, and goslings through the mail. They also sold bargain-priced combinations, the barnyard combo, the fancy duck package, and the turkey assortment. These packages I had thought might offer a way to eat quality meat without breaking the bank but I had never killed anything before. Blithely ignoring this minor detail, I settled on the homesteader's delight, which was two turkeys, 10 chickens, two geese, and two ducks for $42. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so that's that's the homesteader's delight. Two goslings, you guys can tell the greenish looking ones. And then the ducklings are the little more gold peepers. And then does anyone know what the one with like kind of the gold colored one in the middle with the pimple on its head? Turkey bolt, yes. I always say, you can tell because they look like the chicks, but it looks like a chick, but it's a chick on acid. Because they're like, whoa, what's going on? Very confused. Then they're cute. So I put them in this brooder box. Um, and partially why I wrote that other book, The Essential Urban Farmer, that he held up, was because people would write me emails and they're like, I just got my turkeys in the mail. What do I do with them? <laughs> you know, and I'm like, five days later writing back to them. Well, um, you know, so it was kind of, a, it's an instructional too. So it's like how to make a brooder box, how to keep your little babies alive so then you can eat them later. Um, so anyway, so this book I kind of go through. Um, oh, so I, I talk about how I was gonna, um, okay, anyway, I'm just gonna read this part too. I bought my per- Yeah, totally. Let me just get this closer is really what's gonna be good. I bought my poultry package with the click of the mouse and paid for it with a credit card. It was only after the post office delivered the box that I realized that one can't just buy a farm animal like a book or a CD. What I now held in my hands was going to involve a hell of a lot of hard work. I just realized that Amazon probably sells chicks now. I don't really think about that, but I bet they do. So anyway, so I put them under this brooder box and give them water and the turkey poults were very hard to get to drink water. The first turkey poult, um, oh wait, I'm skipping that part. Um, so then Bill walks by, he just like woke up in the morning and he's like, oh my God, what is she doing? He's very worried about what's happening in my brain. The birds were home warm and safe. The chicks scratched at their yellow feed, just like our big chickens out back did. Sometimes they'd stop mid scratch and feeling the warmth of the brooder light would fall asleep while standing up. A puffy gray gosling curled their necks around the yellow sleeping ducklings. A Hallmark card had exploded in my living room. I called my mom. A brooder box full of fowl was something that woman could appreciate. She'd once been a hippie homesteader in Idaho. Listen to this, I said, and I held the phone near the brooder box. A hundred little peeps. Oh my God, she said. Uh, turkey poults, ducklings, goslings, and ten chicks, I crowed. I watched the chicks and poults moving around in the brooder, pooping and scratching, pecking and pooping. Turkeys, do you remember Tommy Turkey, she said. I didn't, but the photo in our family album had stuck with me. My older sister, Rihanna, in a saggy cloth diaper, being chased by the advancing figure of a giant white turkey, Tommy. My mom told us about Tommy every time we got out the old family album from the ranch days. Well, he was mean as hell and he would chase you guys. I looked out the window while my mom described the smokehouse that she and my dad had built. By then, Bill had made it downstairs where he was out front tinkering with our car. Um, I had warned him about my meat bird purchase and he had been excited about the prospect of homegrown meat. But now that he had seen the baby birds, fragile and tiny. He seemed a bit skeptical. Tommy grew to be an enormous size, my mom said. And as back to the land hippies, she and my dad had been very pleased. They didn't encounter any predator problems that year, and butchering him was a cinch. But disaster did hit. The smokehouse burned to the ground while they were smoking the turkey. Oh no, I groaned. Life was like that, she said glumly. I felt sorry for her. My mom's stories usually involve some heroic hippie farm action. I hadn't heard that part of the story before, but I knew that bad things had happened. Her voice brightened. But even though the smokehouse burned down, we did manage to salvage the turkey. What do you mean, I asked. Well, we dug through the charred wood and there it was, a perfectly cooked turkey. I brushed off the cinders and served him for dinner. It was the best turkey I ever had, she said. We said our goodbyes and I hung up the phone. I glanced into the cozy chick brooder. The chicks were sleeping on a mattress of shredded pages from the New York Times. I had to remind myself that though they were cute, these baby birds would eventually become my dinner. Thanksgiving in particular was going to be intense. I imagined the killing scene, a butcher block, an axe, 
um, little Tommy turkeys that I had known since Pulthood. I wasn't sure I could bring myself to do it. But the conversation with my mom left me emboldened from my foray into killing and eating animals I had raised myself. This urge was clearly part of my cultural DNA. I wondered if this would prove that I could have it both ways, to sop up the cultural delights of the city while simultaneously raising my own food. In retrospect, though, I wonder why I thought my experience would be any less disastrous than my parents. So, little cliffhanger. Here's some more cute pictures. Um, so, I raised heritage breed turkeys. I refuse to raise those white ones that are all puffy and they can't even walk and their boobs are dragging on the ground. Um, so this red one is a bourbon red and the one in the background is a um, royal palm. And there is something to be said. They're more like a game bird. If you guys have ever had these heritage birds, um, you have to cook them really hot in the oven, hot and fast. Not like the slow turkey that you're cooking for like five hours in your oven. Um, so there they were. I was able to kill these turkeys. Um, and then I moved on to other things. Um, so I had done a cost analysis of how much it cost me to raise that one Thanksgiving turkey that made it the first year. And it was around $100, okay? This is like 15 years ago, too. This is like forever ago. Um, so that's pretty bad. Um, and, uh, and I realized, like, you know, why am I... And pe my neighbors would ask me sometimes, they'd be like, why don't you just move to the country, you know? And then you could just have this big farm, and why are you doing this in the city? And I started to discover that there is a waste stream in the cities. Um, and that that could be tapped for feeding farm animals. And how that happened was I was drunk in Chinatown one night and um, we were still trying to figure out like the recycling system in the Bay Area. Um, and we were like, this green bin, what? And we whipped it open and inside was like bok choy and like all this stuff that had just been on the shelf, you know, until the store closed and they just threw everything away. And I was like, oh man, animals will want to eat that stuff. And so we started supplementing like our chicken feed um, with, um, with these greens and other things that we'd find, you know, old rice, whatever we'd find in the dumpster. And then I met this woman and she was hell-bent on raising rabbits. Like she was like, it's like the new thing, it's going to be huge. Um, and, uh, and she was going to raise them for meat. She was sort of like, it's like the new grass-fed beef, you know? It's like so carbon neutral, amazing nutrients for your soil, all this stuff. It's kind of like, you know, the Martian. He's like growing potatoes in poop. That's what <laughs> rabbits are, right? It's kind of disgusting, but you're like, well, you know, if you had to survive. Plus, uh, yeah, that's me and my sister. So that's not a pet rabbit. My parents, hippie homesteaders, it's a whole thing. They're all, they were all raising rabbits too. So it's coming around, it was coming around again. So it was my turn. That's a big rabbit. Yeah, that's probably the mama rabbit. Um, and so anyway, I have these memories of even watching my mom processing rabbits. I mean, that's what I, <laughs> that's our term, processing, killing <laughs> rabbits, um, and pointing out all the parts of the rabbit inside. Um, so it's a great biology lesson too. Um, so we start raising rabbits, um, an amazing garden, amazing garden. Like the poop is gold. Like anyone, if you know any pet rabbit owners, like get their poop immediately <laughs> um, because it is so good for your garden. Um, yeah, good stuff. And it's, they're vegetarians, so you're not really worried. You know, you can actually just throw it right into the vegetable beds and go for it. Um, so rabbits. And then um, what happened was rabbits are really picky eaters. So we would have to like get only the freshest bok choy, you know, from the from the dumpster. But in you know in the process of getting to know these dumpsters, it's a relationship. Um, we would start to see like we were like, wow, there's a whole cake in there, and there's half a duck, you know, we're gross. Um, and then Bill said it, my partner Bill. He said, um, man, there's enough food in here to feed you know feed a pig. And so the next thing you know, um, see what I'm saying? Do you see how it's spiraling? Um, so this is one of the pigs, we got two. And uh, 
it was one of those things where like Bill's like, we should, you know, this could feed a pig. And then I happened to be at like a feed store and I saw this, you know, the sign and it said swine auction, you know, next weekend in Boomville. And I'm like, we're there. Um, and so we drove up there because I'm like totally going to get a pig. And, um, and I didn't know how to take care of them. This is a pattern for me is that I would be like, I don't know, I guess I'm going to start raising rabbits. And I, you'd see me like, you know, that night with the rabbits in a hutch or something like reading a book, like how to raise rabbits, you know, so the same exact thing with the pigs. Um, so we went up there and we drove our station wagon because that's what we have for a car. And, um, and I had brought a cage. <laughs> I was like, I want to cage those pigs. I'm like, we can't have pigs running loose in our car. Okay, that at least I nailed. That was awesome. <laughs> totally nailed that one. Um, so we go to the auction. I don't know what a gelt is. I don't know what a barrow is. I don't know what the hell they're talking about. But there's a man standing there in the sawdust with a microphone. And he's like doing that auctioneer thing, you know? do I hear 100, 500, you know, and, it, and it's just like this, I don't know if anyone else has been to an auction before, but it's like you get this adrenaline rush by hearing that voice, that calling, that's saying numbers and things that you don't know what they're saying. And so I have a flag and I'm raising it. <laughs> and it was a 4-H auction, so it was all these little kids and it had been their project pigs, you know. So they're their pigs had had babies, and so they were selling the, the weanlings, is what I learned, so these little guys. Um, and it was funny, because we were in Boonville, and Boonville is like, you know, it's like a rural town, everyone's got a truck. And I swear to God, when we went, after we got these, we bought these guys, we bought two, and um, a boy and a girl, and we're backing up our station wagon. We're like, why is everyone staring at us? You know, because we're like, Meh, you know, and everyone else has a truck, correct? We're like, why? And then, you know, we shut the door and then we got in the car and it was like, these pigs smelled so bad. I mean, I couldn't believe how bad they smelled. Just like total poop, okay? And then we had to drive home on that windy road home from Boomville. I mean, I wanted to puke. It was so gross. But anyway, there we are. They didn't, we didn't, they didn't cause an accident. So I'm just going to read the part where what we do when we get them home. Back in the ghetto, I herded the pigs into their new home. It was just getting dark. The air felt heavy, but it wasn't raining. That morning, in anticipation of the piglets, I had enhanced the chicken area, because we kept chickens in the backyard, with a bucket filled with water and a feeding trough made from the same metal wash tub I had once used to dip and pluck our turkey, Harold. Um, safely behind the closed gate of their yard, the pigs seemed mildly curious, but far from geniuses stomping out Morse code with their cloven feet, thank God. They ran around kicking up sawdust as they had in the ring a few hours ago. The pigs were both red Durocs. Durocs, sometimes called Jersey Reds, are known for quality fat production. These pigs had, even at their young age, the classic arch backs that one often sees in profile on meat company labels. They had curly tails, but it was not a tight curl. And I noticed later that they wagged them when they were happy with a certain food item or the sun was shining just right, or a scratching their backs with a stick. The tails then did convey emotion. As they checked on their surroundings, they made quiet grunting sounds. I had wondered if the city's noises, a police helicopter circling the hood, someone yelling at the junkyard doors, dogs next door, would be a shock to their system. They had, after all, lived in deep country, all trees and pasture, but if they were disturbed by the city's smells and sounds, they made no sign of it. Pigs, I was glad to see, were not that sensitive. Bill and I looked at them, newly installed in their pen. Then they stood in front of the gate and smiled up at us expectantly. We read their minds. Where's the pig chow? So like at the pig auction, they were selling things like pig chow. And I walked right by and I was like, nope straight from the dumpster. We're only feeding them dumpster food. Like I had a rules set up. I did buy a small pink pig brush though. Remembering Charlotte's web, web where they you know, brushed the pigs with like buttermilk. 
which I did try once, and it wasn't, it wasn't as cool as it sounded in the book. They really didn't care. Um, we read their minds, where's the pig chow? On cue, we jumped in the car and raced over to Chinatown. That night, for the first time ever, Bill and I threw open the dumpsters with our hearts and minds. Will they eat, we wondered, these soggy pieces of Chinese donut? I discovered yes. These chunks of leftover duck from the restaurant window that exudes a steady flow of oil, including the duck head? Yes. Wontons and dumplings covered somehow with frosting? Yes. Bill and I anxiously unloaded our two buckets of slop from the car. We had never collected such a disgusting assortment of salty and sweet meat and vegetable. But pigs, I had heard, were omnivorous, and so we were respecting that. <laughs> when we walked through the gate to the backyard, we were greeted by two grunts. I hefted a bucket full of Chinatown into the metal wash tub trough. The pigs began feeding before the second bucket was empty, and so I ended up pouring a load of grapes and wontons over their heads and watched it bounce off their shoulders and land on the ground. Their focus was amazing. While they ate, the pigs let out small sighs of approval. Their lip smacking was audible. At times, they would stop chewing and simply suck up the juice from the trough through their nostrils. They were the best dinner guests ever. The pigs stopped eating for a moment and gazed up at us. Their mouths moved continuously. Their chins were smeared with frosting and grease. Now that I'd thought of it, these pigs had probably never had food like this before. They probably only had their mother's milk, a few handfuls of pig chow, maybe a rotten apple. Now they were eating Chinese, like good urban pigs. So they got pretty big. Um, this is them doing a little song that they like to sing. Um, because they, we started off and we would go to Chinatown once, you know, like every four days or something, you know, because they're little. And then they started to get larger. Um, and then it was sort of like basically every day we would have to go to Chinatown. And um, I had read this thing, because, you know, remember, I never know what I'm doing until I read small scale pig raising. Um, I read a story that Norwegian fishermen used to raise pigs and they would feed them fish guts. Now, I had made the unfortunate discovery that in front of a you know fish restaurant or fish you know st a fishmongering store, this quivering black bag that I never dared open, um, and suddenly I read this book, Fish Guts, and I put it together that I was going to have to go get the quivering bag out of the fish store, um, and Bill came with me. Of course, we always wore headlamps because we go at night. And for some reason, I don't know why, we didn't want to, to put the quivering bag into our car. We wanted to pour the quivering bag into buckets. And so we would stand there and, you know, it would be like mackerel, livers, I don't know, it smelled horrible. Um, and the guts would like splatter my glasses, you know, because they were just like, it was horrible. And um, the first night we did it, a homeless man came up to us and he tried to give us a dollar because <laughs> he was so sad for us that we had stooped to this horrible level. Um, and we were like, no, 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 it's for our pigs. Um, anyway, that happened all the time in Oakland. People were always like, please, can I take you home and feed you? And we would always be like, it's for our pigs, you know. Um, and then they'd be, they'd be like, you got pigs? And so that would be a whole other conversation. Um, so the pigs love the guts, and I started to resent the pigs because we'd have to go get the guts all the time. Um, and then, like anyone that lives in the Bay Area for long enough, they started to want fresh, local, free-range food. Um, <laughs> so they moved away <laughs> from the guts, and um, we started going to um, Fourth Street, if you guys have been to Bor Berkeley, Fourth Street, the fancy restaurants back there. Um, and we would go to Pizzaiolo. There'd be like burnt pizzas in the dumpster. And uh, so we had a whole route. It was like, you know, Bill and I, it was like our hot date for the night, you know. It was like, let's go get some scraps. Um, and at Pizzaiolo, in uh, the Eccolo dumpster, when Eccolo was there, I was like at an Italian, fancy Italian place. Um, you know, we'd be there with our buckets and our headlamps. We'd be like going through it. It would be like, you know, almost whole chickens and like salad that people didn't eat. I mean, 
these pigs were eating better than we were. And in that dumpster, um, I, we were caught. People often ask, were you ever caught? I was like, in Berkeley or Oakland, the cops are just like, yo, what are you doing? <laughs> then you're like, just dumpster diving officer. Then they're like, okay, bye. Um, but in this restaurant, it was kind of like people were eating, maybe they might hear something. And the manager came out and Billy's in the car, like idling the car so we can do the fast getaway. And I'm like going chickens and like throwing stuff in my bucket. And then I hear this <clears throat> and I look up I blind him, you know, because I've got like my, and he's like in an impeccable suit and he's just like the most snotty man. Um, and he's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, you know, and then I'm like, hmm, should I lie and say I have kids and we're starving? Then I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm like, I have two pigs, mister. And I happen to need this food for that. And he says, um, oh. Well, that's interesting. Did you know that the owner of the restaurant is a trained Tuscan butcher? And I'm like, no, whatever. What does that even mean? Um, and so he tells me, he's like, you should go visit Chris. You should make a, pay a visit to the, to the owner of the restaurant. And I'm like, well, whatever. You know, people will be like, what are you going to do with all this pork? You know, they, people will come over and just stare at these giant hogs, right? And I'd be like, I'm going to make prosciutto. And then, like, I hold up the, like, prosciutto for dummies book. And I'm like, how do I make it? You know, like I had no idea. I like bought a meat grinder. I mean, I was just like totally prepping in this way that made no sense. So finally I realized that Chris may be the answer for me. He may help me in this endeavor. And so I go to the restaurant and I say, Chris, I have two pigs in my backyard. I'm feeding them the scraps from your dumpster. Will you help me? And he says, he, it only takes him like five seconds to assess the situation <laughs> and make a deal with me. He's like, you give me the biggest leg of one of the pigs and I will teach you how to make all the salumi in the restaurant. And so on Tuesdays, I started coming every Tuesday for a month and I learned all his tricks. So I learned how to make salami and prosciutto and um, pancetta and lardo, all these things. Um, and he gave me like his recipes that he had learned. Um, and then it was, you know, time for me to have the ki pigs processed. And believe me, I did consider doing it myself. You know, I was like, a gun is easy to acquire in Oakland. Um, but then after I started talking to people, they were like, hmm, you got hairy pigs, though. And I was like, yeah, I got hairy pigs. What does that mean? They're like, well, it's hard to get, you have to scrape them and it takes forever. And so finally I found a person that would, would process them for me. And, um, you have to read about it in Farm City to find out what happened, but basically it was a very disappointing process for me because I like to be involved, you know? Um, and Chris, I called Chris and I was like, this damn lady that killed my pigs. And he's like, Novella, get over it. You know, we're just, bring, that, bring me the meat. And he's like, don't forget the heads. And I was like, oh, there we go. Um, I was like, don't forget the heads, why? Um, and uh, his thing was, see I know, people are like traumatized by this, but I think they look optimistic. Their expressions are optimistic, you guys. They're like, think about this. They were eating like pizzaiolo pizza, okay? And then now it's time for them to go. Um, we had them for six months. We fed them for six months. Um, and, then, uh, and then we turned them into into salami. The reason Chris wanted me to get the heads was because it's a practice to use, you know, head, snout to tail eating, that you would never waste any part of this animal. Like that, although it seems disrespectful, you are respecting them more by actually using the entire thing. So we made this head, amazing head cheese um, with the heads. So it was this beautiful process. Um, so that's where Farm City ends. Um, and then Someone would come to my readings or some, you know, I've read my book and they'd be like, man, you're like the witch in Hansel and Gravel. You're always fattening someone up so you can eat them. And I was like, you're right. I never have a long-term relationship with my animals. Um, and so that's why I started raising goats. So I started raising these little Nigerian dwarf goats, which are perfect for backyards. They're 21 inches tall and they're great milkers super cute, super high butter fat content. So they, it was like milking them was like half and half. It was like I would get like a, you know, jars of half and half basically. Um, this is uh, Orla, this is just right after she was born. 
Um, there was also this great joy of having little beautiful kids jumping around and snuggling. And goats are like cats. They kind of want to sit on your lap and cuddle. Um, and they eat hay. I didn't have to dumpster dive for them anymore. Um, and they were just really, they were really interesting. So and I also liked them because you could make cheese, obviously. And I got really obsessed with making cheese. Um, and then I started giving them to my neighbors because then what I realized is you're like constantly breeding them so they'll, you know, so they'll make milk, right? Um, so that was a big, that was a big aspect. This is um, what my neighbor, Abane, and she started raising goats too and it was a whole thing. Um, but one of the things that I know about raising animals is you start thinking like the animal that you're raising. So for instance, with the pigs, you know, like I'd walk down the street and if someone threw like a sandwich on the side of the road, like half eaten, I mean, we would die for it. We'd be like, the pigs will love that, you know? So we'd carry bags with us everywhere we went. Um, and when you're a beekeeper, you notice what's blooming. You know, it's part of that rhythm of, of noticing nature. Um, and with the goats, I started thinking about like having kids and children. So, whoops! <laughs> and that's my daughter, Frances. Um, and because I would watch the goats giving birth, you know, I'd be like their midwife, and I'm like, I can totally do that. I can totally do that. Um, and that's her like collecting limes. Um, and lately I've become obsessed with fruit trees. Um, so that's what this slide was, is just to show um, we planted, this is two years ago, we planted a big citrus hedge um, to go right um, along MLK. You can see some of the other trees out there. So we have about 30 fruit trees um, on the property and we keep them really small so we're dwarfing them constantly. Um, and so that's probably will be my next book project is, is writing something about something about gentrification in Oakland and, um, and the idea of fruit trees and what is heirloom and um, something like that. That's how I think of book project ideas. I'm like, how about this? Um, and having a kid is changing things too. And then um, now we have little peepers at our house right now. Um, so we have these little chicks and it's all happening again. So my daughter went to the biofuel station where um, the urban farm store is and she saw these little baby chicks and she's like, I want baby chicks. And so now we're starting the next generation, right? So um, I'm gonna end there, ask any questions if anyone has questions. I love talking about manures, um, <laughs> yeah. No, so the goats, um, the goats were really hard. I had them for about three years, um, and uh, and then and I loved I loved them. Um, they were destructive, you know. However, they really I had a I had some fruit trees in the backyard, and those were gone within days. Um, I mean, they just gnaw they just gnaw on everything. I still have a couple sweaters that they like chewed on the arms because like they don't eat like tin cans or sweaters, they nibble on them, you know, and they just make them unwearable. Um, so that's what they do. Um, and also um, with the, what I found with the goats too, um, is that uh, it was tough to find food for them. Like I was trying to buy organic alfalfa and now there's really not so much organic alfalfa and with the drought and everything, it was just so, it would have been so expensive to raise them. So it kind of didn't make sense. I mean, I still think there is a way to do it um, that's sustainable, but it would involve like having friends that are arborists, you know, <laughs> and like you'd have to collect branches for them, which does happen. I mean, they could eat those, those things. Um, so there is a way to do it. I just ran out of steam. Plus, then after I had a kid, you know, and my mom would tell these stories like, yeah, when I was um, pregnant with you, I'd go milk the cow and I'd wear a hubcap and, you know, it was just all this stuff. And I'm just like, you know, I don't need to do that, <laughs> you know, like, and I would try, you know, I thought I would be like the pioneer woman and my kid would be strapped on my back and she would just cry when I was milking the goats, you know, and I was just like, oh, this sucks. And then I would start lactating. It was a mess. It was like a <laughs> lactation train wreck. Um, so I decided... I don't need to do this, but someday I will. Someday I'll get back to it. You know, she's like four now, so could happen. Could still happen. Yeah. So you have citrus trees. Do you have a frost issue? 
I have citrus trees and do I have a frost issue? Um, I don't. That's because it doesn't frost in Oakland. Sorry guys. It's like the best microclimate ever that we have. Um, and you guys get heat so you can grow certain things that we can't grow. But, um, but we never have a frost. If there's like a chance of it dipping to like 32 or something, I'll run out and put, <clears throat> I put, um, you know, like floating row cover over the citrus trees, but it's never a hard frost, God knock on wood. Do you have bees now? Yep, and we have two beehives. We have beehives too, yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought of the issues of farming in outer space? Have I thought of issues farming in outer space? I never did until my students at USF, because I'm like their garden teacher, they're like, hey, can you grow potatoes and poop? And I'm like, where is this coming from? Like, I didn't know, because I'm totally in this media blackout, so I never know anything. And I was like, that is such a great question, you guys. You know, like, let's get really deep about this. I was like, well, the manure has to be rotted down, but yes, you could. And then I'm like, why do you ask? And they're like, oh, we just saw the movie The Martian. And I was like, oh, okay. But yeah, you know. So I didn't think about um, farming in outer space. I actually share an office with Mary Roach, and she wrote a book called Packing for Mars, and it's a lot of, like, prepping for Mars. Um, but it seems like it would be, um, it would be hard for people to live um, on Mars, and so I wonder how hard it would be to grow animals on Mars, you know, it might be. I mean, imagine the pig ride in my state, in my station wagon, <laughs> like in a space shuttle, like, oh my God, it would smell so bad. <laughs> so, yeah, in the back. Yeah. So does that still happen? Do you find people coming in and um, being, do you have a community in the garden, hanging out, making, you know, getting to know neighbors, or is not so much? Oh. Okay, I have to repeat her question. So um, she wants to know if there's still an open gate policy for the garden, and if it maybe creates community, having that open gate, um, if that's still going on. Yes, um, well, so I squatted on that land from 2003 until 2011, and during that time, the, it was, the garden was always open, um, you know, because I didn't own it, and because, you know, it just didn't seem to be a problem. Um, and it was a place where, you know, people would, um, they, a lot of people just wanted to come by and talk about their history and their heritage and what kind of crops they grew. Um, you know, so like the Yemeni storekeeper would come over and talk about figs or beekeeping. Um, and, you know, so people would stop by for sure. And it was a, it was a space for um, tranquility. Um, the farm, I actually bought that property in 2011 after the recession and everything. Um, and um, <clears throat> and w when I did, as soon as my name was on the books, because before I'd been this like squatter, if any city person walked by and they're like, what's going on back there? I'd be like, I don't know, <laughs> you know, just keep walking. <laughs> but the moment my name was on city registration, like city books, um, then I got I got a notice from them that I was not in compliance. And plus I have a blog and I'm like, well, I'm out here gardening and selling vegetables and rabbit pot pies and all this other stuff. So um, the city came and gave me a notice to um, abate because I didn't have a permit to do what I was doing. And what and what how that connects, and I don't know how it works in Walnut Creek, but um, that my lot was on commercial. And so it's only for commercial use, not agricultural use. Um, and so I had to get a special permit. And when that happened, there was a huge like outrage. Like it was like, I don't even know, KTVU showed up. And you know, it was like, everybody was talking about how Novella is getting busted by the city of Oakland. And I'm like standing there with my duck in my hand. And I'm like, why can't I grow my own food, you know? And so people would be like really upset, you know? And it was awesome because my name, this gets to your question, my neighbors were really pissed because they're like, we moved to America because like you can do things like this. Like you can have liberty, right? And that's like kind of when I became like a little bit of a libertarian too because I'm like, man, the city's on my back, you know? <laughs> like go away. Um, 
And, um, but it was funny because the neighbors really rallied, like Moses at Brothers Market, he was like, I know, we'll take a picture, a group picture with everyone who's ever been in the garden and we'll send it to the city. And I mean, eventually the city laid off and it was fine. But I remember this one girl came by with her friends and she's like, I heard you're getting busted. I'm like, yeah. And, um, and she's like, man, I used to get high in that garden. <laughs> you know, it was like, so it was a, a recreational drug um, place too. Um, so anyway, it wasn't so to say that. And it was also like, you know, I have like condoms in there. And, but then one day I was, um, I had my kid, I had her in 2011. And I remember looking out the window and there was like a guy shooting up heroin. See, heroin's a really huge problem now. Um, and I was just like, no. No, because my baby is like crawling around out there, you know, so I locked the gate and I never, I never opened it up again. <laughs> I mean, it's open, like I use it and other people use it, but um, for the most part, it's not open for that kind of stuff anymore. So that's why it's the tragedy of the commons, writ small. Yeah, what's your question? If you could go back to your teenage self, mm -hmm. Okay, if I could go back in time and tell my teenage self something, what would I tell her? Um, what would I, why do you ask that question? Oh, because you're in high school? Okay, 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 let me think. Here's the thing, is I think, um, this is just totally, I don't know, this is not necessarily a good answer, but, um, I feel like I always limited myself, you know? I would just be like, okay, I'll go to University of Washington, it's close to my house, you know? Like that kind of, like the decision making that you make as a teenager should be bolder. Um, that's what I'm saying, is like make bold decisions. Do crazy shit, you know? I was, n I never did crazy shit until I met Bill, you know? Oh, you're gonna have to take out that S-H-I-T, sorry. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, and so then all of a sudden I was like, whoa, we're gonna dumpster dive? Like really, isn't that illegal? And all of a sudden it was like he gave me permission to just go ahead and do crazy stuff. So sometimes you need like a little bad, bad influence or whatever. Um, but so that's what I would say is like, just relax and do stuff because you wanna do it and ask forgiveness, not permission. That's what I tell myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, which came first, writing or farming? Um, I don't know, I used to, I wanted to write when I was like in eighth grade, like I would, you know, try to write novels. I should try to read those again, probably pretty bad. Um, so I think I wanted to be a writer. Um, I, I never thought of writing about my experiences farming. Um, that didn't happen, I went to um, Berkeley's journalism school and uh, I remember, because Michael Pollan was teaching there, um, and it was before Omnivore's Dilemma, and it, before it got big. And he came in, I was working, this is one of my crappy jobs that I had, I worked at a plant nursery. And Michael came into the nursery, and I didn't recognize him at all. And I helped him pick out a plant for his house or whatever. And then when he went to pay, he gave me his credit card, and I was like, Michael Pollan? author of Botany of Desire? Oh my God. And he was like, yeah, I'm teaching over there at that journalism school now, and I'm like, journalism school, never heard of it. What is that, you know? Um, and so I went, I um, applied and got in. I'd been doing some, um, some writing in, when I lived in Seattle for this alternative weekly called The Stranger. Um, and, uh, and then I remember taking class with him. I was sort of taking it too seriously again, where I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna work for the Washington Post, you know, I'm cub reporter and, you know, I was really, but I was like really bad at it. Like I would get people's names wrong and their ages wrong, I would get the whole story wrong. Um, and Michael gently told me one day, he's like, you know, you're a good writer, but I don't know about the reporting. Like what, what if you wrote about like some of the stuff that's going on at your house? <laughs> and at the time I was just like, you know, the weird girl that had chicken poop on her boots. And I was leading like a double life, you know, I was like in grad school, but then farming. And I was like, whoa, I never thought of that, really? And so then I started writing these essays about farming and urban farming. And then that's kind of how that book happened. It kind of took off from there. So kind of not, it was, they came together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Turned upside down. 
Oh, yeah, so she's heard of bees going through the mail, but what about the chicks? Don't they get turned upside down? Well, you know, they come in that box with the holes, and it says fragile, um, so they have air holes. But the other thing is is that chicks, you know, it's kind of like those stories, those miraculous baby stories where, like, the babies can live for days in these earthquake buildings. Chicks are the same way. They have... They're living, they have lived off that yoke, you know, that rich yoke. And so they can, they can survive, but really only for two days max. Um, and they put them together so they're warm, so they keep each other warm, their body heat. I mean, they're not, they don't have a lot of fun time really traveling. <laughs> and I've since changed my ordering, so I get them from a California company, so it only takes a day for them to arrive. But you can also get fertile eggs and have your chickens hatch them out too, which can work. So there's ways around, there's workarounds for everything. <laughs> yeah, in the back. What's the most challenging animal you've ever raised? The most animal ever raised um, definitely goats. And that's because the goats, I know before you guys all buy goat, little Nigerian dwarf goats, um, because goats um, require shots. They require um, toenail clippings, you know, every <laughs> month. Um, you know, you kind of have to be a veteran. It feels like being a vet, you know. When you have babies, you, I mean, you don't want goats with horns, especially in cities, because they can, you know, blind people. So there's this disbudding iron I bought to fry off their little tiny pre-horns. I mean, it's all James Harriet type stuff you're doing when you have goats. I mean, administering shots and, you know, worm deworming medicine and then alone then with that is like you also if you want milk, you're constantly cuz it's it's illegal. See, I started to follow rules a little bit, but it's illegal to have a male goat in city limits. So, why? Anyone ever smelled a male goat? They like pee on themselves and let it rot and roll around and stuff. So they really do stink. Um, but when I would, when my girls would go into heat, I would be like, oh, I gotta go get a male. So I'd go up to this farm. <laughs> I had a pickup truck at that time, but for some reason, like Mr. Lincoln, you know, they always have like really cute names, Mr. Lincoln, he'd sit up front with me, shotgun, you know? <laughs> I was just like, and then people would drive by and they'd be like, what the? You know, and, you know, so it was just like this whole other level of craziness that goats involve. But I have to say, and I'm going to end here, the hardest farm animal I've ever raised is my daughter. Um, because anyone, and I'm like, you people that have raised children, you've done it. You picked up poop and you cleaned up stuff. I mean, it's, it's incredible how much work a human is. And, you know, unlike the goats where I'd be like, well, they're gonna just gonna go in their shed and go to sleep tonight, you know, the screaming baby, you know, at four in the morning or whatever, that's tough. So anyone who's raised children, you are an urban farmer in your heart, you can do it. Thank you very much. <laughs>